Hello again. We continue in this session an introduction to the gospel according to John. Kataianes. And this study is uh, to continue looking at the introductory material that has to do with this great study of the Logos, the Word, the second person of the Godhead, who came to earth and was sacrificed for us. My name is Keith Mosier. I'm one of the instructors at the Memphis School of Preaching, and it is my privilege there to teach many of the books of the Bible. And over the years, John has been a great study for me. I hope it is for you. We're looking at introductory material because it's very important to study the material ahead of studying the text. Folks who just jump into the text oftentimes misinterpret the book because they have not realized its setting or its background or what was going on and why it had to be written and that kind of thing. And when we get those things settled, then a study of the text becomes more clear to us, and we begin to understand why John said certain things about Jesus. This particular text only covers about 20 to 30 days of the Lord's life, so it's really not a biography. It's a treatise on the deity of Christ, the Word who was made flesh. And I come today to the question as to where John was when he wrote this. And it's my view that he was in Ephesus in Asia Minor, which is what is now called Turkey. In fact, as I speak to you today, there was a terrible earthquake in the Antioch, Syria area, south of where John was when this was written, that killed 46,000 people and has leveled the city of Antioch, really. And so we're praying for those folks. But where was he? Ephesus in Asia Minor, or what we call Turkey, Ephesus being one of the seven churches of Asia that, to which the Lord had John write later in, in the, what we call the book of Revelation. Irenaeus said, Afterwards, John the disciple of the Lord, who also leaned upon his breast, did publish himself a gospel during his residence at Ephesus in Asia. That comes from Against Heresies, the, the third volume, one, and uh, so, according to Irenaeus, John was in Ephesus when he wrote this. Jerome said the same thing, that John was in Asia Minor when he wrote. James Hastings in his Interpreter's Bible, which is a very uh, left-wing kind of an attempt, did make the statement, though, that it's universally regarded that John was in the city of Ephesus when he wrote this account. We only have one piece of evidence against that, and that comes from a hearsay source, really, uh, a report from a man named Papias, but it's hearsay because we don't have any actual writings of Papias. Uh, we would assume then, along with uh, all of the commentators, that John was in Ephesus. That hearsay evidence from Papias said that John and James were killed and but by the Jews, but we know that not to be true, that we know that John was still living after James was killed, James being the brother of John. And we know that John uh, James was killed way before John ever died. And John was in exile on the island of Patmos, according to his account in the Revelation. And so where was it written? In the city of Ephesus in Asia Minor is my conclusion. Uh, this book is well attested as to its authenticity in terms of the context and then its genuineness. Was John actually the author? Now, I mentioned just a moment ago Irenaeus, and Irenaeus lived from 140 to about 202, A.D. 140 to A.D. 202. And Irenaeus is the one who quotes Polycarp, about John, and Polycarp knew John. And uh, it, we also have Irenaeus quoting Polycarp's use of this book, and he's quoting John, Polycarp says. Uh, Theophilus, the bishop of Antioch, 
around A.D. 170, said John wrote this. The Apostle John did. So we have some ancient church fathers well attesting to the fact that John is our author. So we have outside evidence. We have inward evidence. Uh, Theophilus, that bishop of Antioch that I just mentioned, lived about the time Justin the Martyr did, and Justin the Martyr wrote commentaries using John's gospel. And so it was already in existence before A.D. 145. And uh, he, he calls it uh, the Memoirs of the Apostles. And uh, in fact, Justin the Martyr said that this book was read in many of the solemn meetings of the church. Uh, the Testament of the Twelve, written by somebody, t attests, says that John, and attests to the fact that John wrote prior to AD 130. Now, I've already indicated this is a late gospel account. Could be as late as 80, 90 to 95, somewhere in that range. Well, we have evidence, physical evidence, that it was in existence in AD 130. Tertullian in Carthage quoted John, and we got that from the fragment of the Miratorian canon that he did that. Even the early heretic Marcion knew this gospel. Uh, he quotes John, however, <laughs> even though he didn't like what John said. Earlier than our Aranez, uh, we have Ignatius around AD 107 quoting from John. And so you have some very early church fathers quoting from this great account concerning the deity <coughs> of the Christ. It's also the case that this gospel account appears in a number of early manuscripts. The Syriac Peshitta, the common Syriac, the earliest translation from the Greek that we know anything about, second century, quotes from, has John in it. The old Latin texts from those same centuries have John in them. The Muratorian Canon from about 8170, John's there. The canon of origin, who lived down in Alexandria, Egypt, John is in his canon. Uh, Eusebius canon, John's in it. And so uh, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, very early Greek manuscripts that we have in our possession. The Sinaiticus happens to be in the British Museum, and the Vaticanus, of course, in the possession of the Catholics in Rome. But both of those codices, have John in them. They're very early Greek manuscripts. All of the Latin codices have John in them. The Western codices have John in them. All of the manuscripts are replete with the gospel according to John. And so we know for sure that this is a, an inspired text, a text always included in the Bible, and it's interesting that this gospel account appears fourth in all of those manuscripts, just as it does in our English versions. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, same way in the manuscript evidence. And so what I want to do here, given the fact that we have this background, is take a look at a word found in the very first verse of John's account. We're going to read it first in the English, and then we will take a look at some of these words in the original Greek language in which John wrote. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The New World Translation tries to eliminate the deity of Christ from this verse. This Jehovah's Witness production has, and the word was a God. You cannot do that to the Greek language and put an A where a the is. First of all, the Greek language has no A or an in it. It's an arthrus, this language. No A or an, no definite uh, 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 article. Yes, the, but no A or an. And so they don't even exist in the Greek language. So to put it here adds to the Word of God. But the text says just what we read in the English. 
The term logos, however, is the word, this translated word. In the beginning was the logos. Let's anglicize that word so you'll know what I'm saying there. L-O-G-O-S, logos. And this term was developed by Heraclitus of Ephesus. Heraclitus is often called the weeping philosopher. This Greek philosopher is said to have stood with his feet planted on either side of a small stream, and he was looking down at this stream passing away from him, and he began to weep. And someone asked Heraclitus, why are you weeping? He said, I just realized I cannot see the same creek stream twice. Well, that's rather a strange individual weeping over the flow of water. But he began to think about the movement of that water. And he crossed a river one day and he reflected to a friend, I, you know, I can't cross the same river twice. Made him sad and so he wept. But then he realized that even while he crossed the first time, the river was changing. So he never really crossed it once, and he wept again. <laughs> kind of an unusual fellow. Behind all of this flow was something making it move. Heraclitus called that logos, flux. Something was, something was making the river move, and he called it the logos. And he identified this movement with reason and the conscience of man. That somehow there was something flowing through us, some kind of flux, and we're seeing the movement. And we'll, we really cannot capture it. That's logos to Heraclitus. A physical thing, moving things. But John uses the word logos by his own definition. John says, Heraclitus, in essence, logos is not a thing. It's not something that gives movement to the universe. It's a being. It's a creating being. It's the Word of God. It's the second person of the Godhead. That's the true Logos. And when we study the word Logos in John's account, we have to understand he's going against the Greek philosophy of his time. And the Greek philosophy of his time had led to a doctrine that was permeating people's minds who were already Christians. And this full-blown doctrine permeating people's minds we know now as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism bore from the Greeks the idea that the flesh is evil. So this flux moving through us had to be created by a being, and therefore since flesh is evil, the being who created it is evil. And since the Lord Jesus and the Father are the creating beings along with the Holy Spirit. Since they are the creators, they have to be evil. And so the Gnostic said, I know that those three beings are just emanations of some kind from an original pure God he called the Demiurge. And John's going to hammer at that point that the Word was God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And so I have to understand John's use of Logos in the definition he gives, because he cannot give you the Greek definition. He has to use this term differently from the way they used to it. So John didn't take some concept of Greek philosophy and put it on top of Jesus somehow, or foisted it on the Lord. John told us what the real Logos was, the real one who caused the movement in the universe. 
John's use of logos means something, really, other than our language can express. It means idea, reason, speech. It didn't take its rise in natural forces, the way John uses it. In some mysterious substance uncontrolled and evil. No. Sadly, there are those among us still teaching what a form of Gnosticism. When they talk about a war going on between our spirit and our flesh. That's Gnosticism. See, the flesh is evil to the Gnostic, to the Greek, to the philosophy of the Greeks. This is evil. This flesh of mine is evil. And since the Lord Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit were part of that creation, they're evil. That's Gnosticism. Well, let's think about the word flesh here for a moment. It leads some people to think that we have a sinful nature. And so they have translated in their Bibles the word S-A-R-X, flesh, sarx, S-A-R-X, flesh. They've translated it sinful nature. And this war between our sinful nature and our spirit is such that we cannot overcome. And so what we have to do is have a direct operation of the Holy Spirit to work on it somehow so that we are able in our sinfulness to obey the gospel. We can't do that because we are totally depraved. <coughs> and so we have to talk about the war between our flesh and our spirit <coughs> as if our flesh were some kind of living thing in terms of spirituality. Let me apologize for my voice today. It's not what it ought to be. <coughs> but our flesh is not evil. Our flesh, our bodies, are not evil. If I thought my flesh were evil, I could test that. I'll just cut this part of my hand off and lay it over here and see what evil it does. Nothing. It just lies there. It's just flesh. Any evil thought takes place here in my mind. That's why Paul said, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it, sin, not your body, in the lust thereof. It's up here. Here's your lust organ right up here. And so the flesh is not evil. In fact, we have the ability, John, uh, Paul said, to stop it, that is sin, from reigning in our mortal bodies. We don't let, have to let, we don't have to sin. We have sinned, but we don't have to sin. And our flesh is not evil. And so John is going to answer this for us all through this, this uh, account. And that's why he starts with logos and gives us these true definition of this term, the way he uses it, to refer to an actual being who before he ever came to earth was God. In the beginning was the Word, not Jesus. In the beginning was the Word. And I want now to comment on that thought. John wrote this gospel account. He had to write against the Greek philosophy of his day and the term logos is used the way he not the way the Greeks used it, but the way John uses it. And third, I want to take a look at this word logos, and I'm using an article here as background for this particular part of the study from Alexander Campbell that was written way back in 1827, March 1st. The article is in his Campbell's paper, The Christian Baptist, from that period. That paper lasted from 1823 to 1830, and when he started publishing in 1830, The Millennial Harbinger. The reason he called it The Christian Baptist is he was trying to keep a friendship with the Baptist Church that, of course, broke 
apart when they began to realize what he was teaching about baptism and its efficacy in salvation. The man who encouraged Campbell to call it the Christian Baptist was Walter Scott out of eastern Ohio, which was called then the Western Reserve. And Scott encouraged him to do that so that they could maintain that friendship, but that was a mistake. That friendship lasted about 15 years, and of course they broke ranks. But the reason that Campbell was asked to comment on the word logos was something that Barton Warren Stone was teaching. Barton Warren Stone out of Kentucky, Cane Ridge, Kentucky, was teaching that Jesus was created sometime in the eternity, that he was not a, an eternal being. That's why John says, in the beginning was the Word. He doesn't say from the beginning or at the beginning. He says in it. That's eternality. He already existed in the beginning. And that's why he could make everything, because he in, existed already in the beginning. But Campbell was asked to comment on Stone's teaching. And it, Campbell was reluctant to do so. He and Stone had joined forces in, in the Christian connection, and uh, there were uh, some things that he really didn't want to say. But he wrote this, and this article is called To Timothy. Whoever Timothy was, I don't know. But Campbell wrote, you will re recollect that when I was interrogated on that subject about the eternality of the Word, I gave many reasons why I felt reluctant to speculate on the incomprehensible Jehovah. When he was first asked about this, you see Campbell was reluctant. But then he adds, it was also stated that there was no topic in common estimation so awfully sacred as that of the doctrine of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now what we're going to have to learn is the name Jesus was not given to him until he was born of the virgin. He's not called Jesus in eternity. In eternity, he's called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, not Jesus. He's not yet in human form in the beginning. He's full deity in the beginning. He's not yet given that name, Jesus. So in the beginning was the Word, and so Campbell wrote, we have to think about the Trinity, the Father, the second person, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The three beings, all of whom are deity. And so he says, if a man did not speak in a very fixed and set phrase on this subject, he would endanger his whole Christian reputation and his own usefulness. But then Campbell added this. <clears throat> At the same time, I remarked that I was very far from being afraid about either to think upon this subject or to express my thoughts. Although it was deemed so unpardonable to part even in one monosyllable from the orthodox views, Campbell knew the minute, the minute he started speaking on the Logos that he was going to have to go against orthodox views. Because in the orthodox Christianity of his day, and even today, Jesus is a created being, and he's eternally the Son. Every denomination I know anything about teaches his, that he is the eternal Son. No, not according to John. He wasn't the Son until he was born of the woman. He wasn't called Jesus, according to Matthew, until he's born of the woman. And that is exactly the prophecy of Isaiah 7.14. And so Campbell says, I know that what I'm about to say is different from what is speculated in denominationalism. And so here's what he added. He writes this article about the term Logos with this remark. If, however, you will not make a new theory out of my expositions, in other words, don't split the brotherhood over it, nor contend for any speculation on the subject, nor carry the views further than I intended, I always tell my students, please don't quote me from your notes. 
Uh, sometimes we tend to take what our teacher says further than he intended it to be, and that's what Campbell was worried about. He said, but I want to tell you my views of the first sentence in John's preface to his testimony. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Campbell's first comment, he said, in the first place, I object to John Calvin's view of Jesus. I do too. They make, and they, they take Calvin and Augustine and those fellows for their doctrine, him the eternal son. They won't allow the Logos the Savior of mankind, eventually, to have been an eternal creature, equal with God. They won't allow that. So they always have Father, Son, Holy Spirit, a kind of down-the-ladder doctrine about the three. When John says, here's where they were, not stair-step down, here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And so we don't agree. And Campbell says, I object to their making Him and calling Him an eternal Son, because I think that if He were only the Son of God from all eternity, He is entitled very little, if any, glory. That's why Paul wrote, he thought it not a thing to be held on to, to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. We have no way of teaching the humiliation of the second person of the Godhead, who had to come in human form to become our Savior. We can't teach that if we think he's eternally the Son. We can't come to that conclusion if we believe what these people are teaching in the denominational realm that he is eternally the Son. So Campbell's first comment was, John said, in the beginning was God. That second person is God now, fully. Not yet God-man. In the second place, he said, I object to something else. I object to the doctrine of the Arians on their uh, teaching about the existence between the Father and the Savior in eternity. Because it, makes, it mixes up things human and divine. There's no humanity said about the second person of Godhead in John 1.1. 1, 1. Nothing mentioned here about His humanity. We, we can't read that until we get to verse 14. And the Word was made flesh. And so Campbell, as I, we object to that. And here's what Campbell wrote. The names Jesus, Christ, or Messiah, only begotten Son, Son of God, belong to the founder of the Christian religion and none else. They express not a relation existing before the Christian era, but re Relations which commenced at the time he started to come and develop the Christian era. In the third place, Campbell argued that the Holy Spirit caused John to write the word Logos here. I agree. And that means that the word that John chose, Logos, is the precise relationship that the Holy Spirit wanted to indicate in the use of that term. And this idea of in the beginning was the word is a different relationship than a father and a son in terms which always imply disparity, big father, little son. Before I go any further, we have to understand something about that expression, Father, Son. And I want you to look with me at the fifth chapter of John for a moment and verse 18. 
If you have a text there, or if you don't and you're taking notes, mark this verse down. John 5, 18. In the Jewish way of thinking, to say someone is my son is not a matter of disparity. I'm the father, he's the little boy. In the Jewish way of thinking, when you said, that's my son, you made that boy equal with the father. Watch. John 5, 18. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father. Listen carefully now. He said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. That's a Jewish concept. And I'm afraid that in, even in our language, father, son, gives people the impression, little Jesus, big father. When in fact, he said, I and my father are one, John 10, 30. You see what John's doing? He's showing us the deity of Christ and the initial relationship in eternity. He's the word. And that's the term that the Holy Spirit uses here to describe that relationship. And so... Let's think about that, Campbell said. And he postulated a few thoughts about a, the term word. And Campbell thought through this. What word in English would you use to describe the relationship between the Father and the second person of the Godhead in all eternity? Can you think of a term like that? That's quite a relationship. All relations we know anything about are created. Father, Son. But He's not created. He's not a created being. That's John's point. He wasn't created in eternity, the way Stone taught. That's called Socinianism, incidentally. He's not eternally the Son. He's the Word, and He's God. So what term would you use? And so, in the wisdom of God, God said, use the term logos. That's God's wisdom. And that tells me that that term expresses in the best way possible, and the most suitable way possible, the most spiritual way possible, and not a carnal way of that relationship between the Word and the first person of the Godhead in all eternity. And so the Holy Spirit selected this term, and I can assume safely that that's the best way to describe that relationship. And I'm thinking when I read Campbell on this idea of how much thought he had to give to this study. Campbell knew what Greek philosophy said that the flesh is evil, and since these created flesh, they are evil, that kind of thing, Gnosticism. And so you think about the term the Holy Spirit used here, and then you think about a word, and you think about the word, word. Let's think about that a moment. What's a word? Campbell said that a word is a representative of a thought. It represents an idea. It's a symbol. And a word can represent an idea in a visible form or audible form. But it's the exact image of the thought. And until I express the word, you won't know what thought I had. So there's a direct relationship between a word and its thought. They, they exist at the same time. They are co-etaneous. You can't have the word without the thought. You can't have the thought without the word. It is true that you may not utter the word for years, but still, the Word is just as old as the idea. That's John's point. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. The Word is as old as God. God has no age. He's eternal. 
Those two terms are coetaneous, the Word and His thought. And so is the Word and God, coetaneous, of the same age, eternal. However, the Word and the thought are distinct from one another. You know what a Word is. You know what a thought is. So Campbell said, the idea and the Word are never less distinct from each other, though the relation between them is the nearest known on earth. I don't know of a relationship nor that is closer than a word and his thought, but you know there is a distinction there. And so there's a distinction between the word and the Father. Two beings. But an idea cannot exist without a word, and a word cannot exist without an idea. And if I'm acquainted with the word, I know the idea. That's why we're going to read in this text eventually that Philip said to Jesus, show us the Father, and the Lord's expression there is so poignant. He answered Philip and said, Philip, have I been so long with you and you don't know me? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. John 14, 1 through 5. And so we have a word here, and correctly observe, we have a word used to describe the relationship between the Father and the second person of the Godhead in all eternity. And that word was an exact image of the invisible God, Hebrews 1.3. The word could not exist without the idea, and the word of God could not exist without the Father. So God was never without the word, nor was the word ever without the Father. We don't have an eternal son here. And the Word is of equal age or coetaneous with the idea, and so the Word of God is coetaneous with the Father. They're, they are both eternal. And the idea did not create the Word, and the Word did not create the idea. Neither one of these is created beings. The Word was God. Such a view does the language used by John suggest. And all of the scriptures we'll ever read agree with that thought. The Word was made flesh. It doesn't say Jesus was made flesh. It says the Word was. The Word Deity is now in a body. And he lived among us, tabernacled among us, tended here. In fact, that body was made for him by God. Hebrews chapter 10. And God was always with the Word. And the Word was always with God. But the Word became flesh. He's Emmanuel. God with us. And as John starts it, he says, and as the Word ever was the representation of the invisible God, we must always know Him in eternity as the Word of God. Now, all of that said, what we are explaining is the nature of the relationship in eternity before the Word came here. In other words, He pre-existed. Let me say to us very clearly right here that the pre-existence of Christ is attested to, the pre-existence of the Word is attested to, the pre-existence of the second person of the Godhead, excuse me, is attested to in the Old Testament. Joshua saw the captain of the Lord's host. Joshua chapter 5. Isaiah saw this person seated on a throne, high and lifted up. His train filled the whole temple, Isaiah 6.1. He saw Jehovah on a throne, but he did not see the Father. How do I know that? Look at John 1.18. No man has seen God at any time. 
the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, when John writes this, he'd gone back to heaven. He has declared him. And so we know Isaiah didn't see the Father. In fact, John 12, 41 is clearly uh, written so that we know that who, it was, who it was that Isaiah saw. He saw the second person of the Godhead. He saw the Word called Jehovah. He's deity sitting on, sitting on that throne. So he's preexistent as the Word, not as Jesus. And when I think about the second person of the Godhead that way, that lifts up this being to the level he's supposed to be. He's not just human, Jesus. He's God in a human body. It's interesting that the first record we have of any being confessing him that way came from a demon. He said, we know who you are, the Holy One. Did you come to tell me us before the time? The first sentence of John from eternity was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was, I say, from all eternity with God. Verse 2. All things were made by Him, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. He became a child born and laid in a feed box. He became a son of man, and when He became son of man, He was then called Jesus by Joseph, Matthew 1, 18 through 25. He was then called Messiah, Son of God, only begotten of the Father. In the beginning was the Word. We call this idea of deity in a human body, deity in flesh, incarnate. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The portrait of the Word that John paints is the portrait of deity in a human body. The deity of Christ must be confessed by all of us before we're baptized. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. I hope you understood that when you said that, you were confessing His deity. Because that was, that's what it means to be the Son of God. And we are made partakers of the divine nature when we are in Christ. And so John would write later in a letter called 1 John, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Hmm. Therefore the world knows not, because I knew Him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that when we, He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. 1 John 3, 1 through 3. A man named Rutherford wrote, as he thought about the Word made flesh, God became man that we might learn what a man should be. How tender and true and strong. How patient to suffer wrong. When he for our sakes did die, and rising went back on high, still God, he then has sent a guide by the way he went. God became man that we might learn what a man 
should be. In the beginning was the Word, John wrote. And so you have in the first verse of this text the Word and Deity. The eternal being in the beginning was the Word. You have His personality, God, and the Word was with God. And you have His nature, and the Word was God. So you have the Word and deity. Then you have a connection between the second person of the Godhead and creation, the Word and creation. The same, the Word, was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Well, if all things were made by Him that was made, He didn't make Himself. He's eternal. That's the point. So you have the Word and creation. You have the eternality or antiquity of the Word in creation. In the beginning was the Word. And the same was in the beginning with God. You have the agency of creation. God said all things were made by Him. And you have the activity He did in the creation. Without Him was not anything made that was made. So you have the Word and deity, and then you have the Word and creation. And then the Word who is deity who became flesh. The Word who was the, one of the creating agencies, if not the creating agency, this one came to give us life. So you have the Word and life itself, real life, the fountain of life. In Him was life. Verse 4. You have the very source of life. In Him was life. And you have the effect of that life on men in that verse 5. The light shineth in darkness, but the darkness didn't comprehend it. And then you have the scope of that life that came. This life lights every man, John 1, 9. That was the true light, which lighteth every man, that cometh into the world. So you have the Word and deity. You have the Word and creation. You have the Word and life. Mark told us, Mark chapter 10, that the Son of Man came to be, to serve, not to be served. Verse 45. And then John added, and he came that we might have life, and that more abundantly, John 10.10. 10. So there's a connection between a real life and the Word. And without the Word, you have no real life. And then John says, and there's a connection between the Word and the world. Look at verse 10. He was in the world. So... He came here. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, John 3, 16. And so He came here. He was in the world. And the world was made by Him. We know He was active in the creation. Watch this. And the world knew Him not. That has to be one of the saddest statements in all of Scripture that the one who came from heaven, the second person of the Godhead, took on human flesh to be humiliated here, was not known when he got here. In fact, they rejected him and killed him. And so John writes, and there's a relationship between the Word and me, the Word and man, watch. He came unto his own, Mankind, in this case the Jews, and his own received him not. But, and I like that thought, as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And keep that in mind, 
born of God when we get to the new birth. Notice, the second person of the Godhead contacted man. We didn't go looking for him. He came looking for us. And he's rejected. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. They said, no, we don't want you. But some received. And they, when they received him, had the authority to be saved, to go ahead and obey him, to become sons of God. And then we're told how he did it. We have the word deity, creator, life, the source of it. He contacted the world, was rejected for the most part, and in order to do all of this, John says, he was incarnate. And the Word was made flesh. Can you imagine thinking that flesh is evil and that the holy second person of the Godhead would put that on? No. Nothing evil about my flesh. There are some evil thoughts in my mind that might make my flesh do something I should not do. But I'm told not to let that reign in my mortal body. Romans 6.12 The Word dwelt among us. The Word dwelt as tabernacle. He put on that tent and lived here. Walked among us. Got his feet dirty. Got tired. Worked as a carpenter in his father's shop, evidently, as he grew. And when he was 30 years old, he started his ministry. And three and a half years later, they killed him. The Word became flesh. And John says, we beheld his glory. Would you open your New Testament to 1 John for a moment? Something John says here is so amazing. Not only did they see him, they did something else. This is 1 John chapter 1. And John refers to the Word being made flesh. He says, That which was from the beginning, when He was born, when He became flesh, which we have heard. John says, We heard Him teach. He sat down one day and taught us for a long time. Matthew 5, 6 and 7. We heard Him. We saw him. He was in the flesh. He was sitting right there, standing right there, walking right there. We saw him. And we looked upon him. We studied him. They didn't just hear him and see him. They studied him. And they touched him. He's not a phantom. He's real. He's in a body. A real body. We touched him. Our hands have handled of the world life. He said the life was made known. The giver of life, the creator, the word, the second person of the God. We made and we saw it. And we're bearing witness and show unto you that eternal life, which was with the Father. See, the word was with God and the word was God and was made known to us. And then he says that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that you may also have fellowship, look at that, with, with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write we unto you that your joy may be full. Thank you, John. You studied Him. You saw Him. You heard Him. You touched Him. He's real. He's God in the flesh. And we beheld His glory. They basked in His glory. And then we have a connection between the Word and His revealing. John bear witness of Him. That's John the baptizer. This was He of whom I speak, He that cometh after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. Watch. And of his fullness 
have all we received. Jesus held nothing back. He gave everything he had. And grace upon grace. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, now when John writes, this is where Jesus is, which was, is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. My friend, do you want to know what God is like? Study Jesus. He gives us the picture. One last thought. The light has come. The rest from the guilt of sin has come. The Word was made flesh, and He never juggled the facts. He never promised what He could not give. He did not wave a magician's wand over life and tell everybody everything's going to be fine. He simply gave Himself. And John says, we saw the perfect glory of life in Him. And that perfect glory of life is available to anyone who will become a Christian. Because the thief cameth not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. But he came that we might have life and that more abundantly. And so he, is, he says, I am the bread of life, John 6, 48. I am the light of the world, John 8, 12. I am, John 8, 58. I am the door of the sheep, John 10, 7. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11. I am the resurrection and the life, John eleven twenty five. I am the way, the truth, and the life, John 14, 6. I am the true vine. John 15, 1. Jesus is the way, and my friend, without Him you can't go. Jesus is the truth, and without Him, my friend, you cannot know. And Jesus is the life, and my friend, without Him you can't grow. And so you can't know, and you can't go, and you can't grow without the Christ. The second person of the Godhead left heaven left heaven, left heaven, to come here and be humiliated, to give His life a ransom for all. In the beginning, that's not Jesus, yet, that's the Word. And that Word, the exact image and the same age as the Father, came to earth. That's John's account, and that's what he will set out to emphasize over and over again, the deity of the second person of the Godhead. Thank you for your attention.